Hey everyone, welcome to a third episode of Code with Joel, an entire three years later. I had originally planned to do these a little more frequently. Uh, I guess life kind of got in the way, but now here I am. I'm going to try to keep up with it a little more frequently. Right now my current working target is once per month, but we'll see what happens. So today we're, we're going to focus on four kind of key things. So we're, we're going to learn how to scrape historical cryptocurrency and stock data. We're going to learn how to calculate daily returns from that data set. What we're going to do with those daily returns, we're, we're going to put them into a hierarchical clustering algorithm that allows us to identify correlated versus uncorrelated asset classes. In today's case, we're going to be looking at cryptocurrencies first and then stocks later. From, from there, what we're going to do at the end is look at a kind of backtest comparison of a correlated portfolio versus a uncorrelated portfolio. So let's dive right in. So I, I have here in my RStudio IDE, uh, you know, a list of the packages that we will be using today. You can see on, on my screen, we have uh, rows eight through 17 that kind of describe the, the different packages we're gonna be using. Uh, if, if you don't have these packages, what you can do is just run install.packages and then the package name that you do not have. You're, you're just gonna, you know, for example, if you don't have portfolio analytics, you, you just put portfolio analytics in quotations and then, you know, just run it. Uh, after you have verified that you have all of the libraries in your R coding environment, uh, just go ahead and, you know, give all these packages a run. Um, you know, so just run run this chunk in your R markdown. Uh, so you should be able to successfully run everything without any error messages after after uh, loading it up for the first time. So, you know, I'm clicking on the, the chunk here on the top right and it seems to be going through just okay. So, so in the rest of this, uh, you know, uh, um, code file, uh, I've, I've kind of detailed the different sections that we're going to be focusing on. If you want to go straight to the code, I've uploaded everything in, in the GitHub that's linked in, in the uh, description below. So if you want to check that out directly, uh, all the code should be on there. So yeah, let, let's jump right into it. So section one, we're going to get a list of all crypto tickers and their price history. Uh, there's this really useful R package called Crypto2, which is kind of on line nine that has a series of functions that really quickly allow you to pull in some, some uh, cryptocurrency data and metadata. So what you can do is you can just reference the package name and then, you know, do two colons after each other and see all the functions in that package. In, in this case, we're going to use the crypto list function. You don't really have to use the uh, package name as a, as a prefix. Uh, you can just run it directly. So I'm, I'm going to control enter uh, this function over here. You, and, and you can see what this function does is it returns a entire list of basically thousands of cryptocurrencies, gives you an ID, tells, tells the name of this cryptocurrency, the symbol, the slug, the rank, which I think is according to market cap. Uh, and a bunch of other metadata, right? So we, we can quickly look at glimpse, uh, which is a function in the dplyr package that shows you all the column names in a different way. So so here you can see just you know the, the same data set in a slightly different context. So so this is the first function that we're going to use to to extract all the crypto data. The second function we're going to use is crypto underscore history. And, and so th this function is kind of a quirky function because it requires the, the parameters that you put into it to be in a very specific way. Uh, what I've done up here is you can see uh, some of the documentation. And if you, if you read through the documentation, what you'll see is uh, if, if you just put in a one into the, the function, it's going to return uh, just you know price history for one cryptocurrency. So let, let's just see what this looks like. So we're, we're going to assign this cryptocurrency object to crypto history one. I think we do limit equals one. 
And you can see now in, in the output, it says scraping historical crypto data, processing historical crypto data. So it might take a little bit of time to, to fully load. What, what we're gonna eventually go through, you'll see is uh, we're, we're going to pull in, uh, you know, the top 100 cryptocurrencies according to market cap. It's gonna take way too much time to pull in every single cryptocurrency that exists. Uh, and, you know, for this purpose of identifying uncorrelated assets, we'll, we'll just work off of 100. I've actually saved down a CSV file, which I'm referencing in the, the code itself. It takes about 20, 30 minutes to completely pull in uh, all, all of the uh, crypto crypto data. So, so let's wait for this to load. And while we do that, uh, I'm, I'm going to quickly show you a couple things here. So you can see in the, the console down below, it gives you a ETA as you're running the crypto history list. For, for this one, it just coincidentally finished as I, I was uh, popping it open. But what you'll see when we go through an exercise of pulling all cryptocurrencies, it's going to take a little longer. And I think I, I was quoted 20, 30 minutes. Depends on your internet speed and whatever have you. Um, but so let's take a look at this. So crypto underscore currency. So you'll first notice that the timestamp object is in kind of a funky looking, uh, uh, you know, data structure. So this timestamp corresponds with, you know, the date. So this is a time series data set. I, I was able to figure out that if you just, con if you want to convert this to a more workable time series object, you can do mutate timestamp equals as character timestamp. And, and you'll see after running this, you get this nice date time object. So it looks like, you know, you have the year, the month, the date, and then you have this kind of uh, timestamp, which is always 1159 uh, at night. We, we can, but you'll notice that I, I said as character and the column type is character. So we, we want to get this into a date format. So we'll just add one more row as date timestamp and so let's see here so now as state cool so so after running that you can see that this Column type is now a date. Let, let's take a quick look at this data set and see, you know, what's under the hood. So, um, you know, I'm a big fan of the glimpse function just to quickly get a, you know, as the name implies, to quickly glimpse at what the data set looks like. Looks like I'm missing a parentheses here, so let me just close that out. And after running this data set, you can see there are 16 columns. You have all this different you know, metadata associated with a coin. What, what is the slug, the name? You can see in this case, it's Bitcoin. It has the symbol, the reference currency. So what is Bitcoin being quoted in? You have other things like the market cap, the some, some other date metadata, which I'm, you know, for the purpose of this tutorial, just going to glimpse over. And let's take a quick look more Specifically, at, you know, the progression of, you know, the, the Bitcoin price over time, for example. So we can do ggplot, gonline, AES, timestamp, and the closing price, which is close. So I'm, I'm getting close from, from this column. You can see that there's a column called close, so that's kind of the last recorded time uh, in which the, the price was recorded. So if I just quickly give this a run, you'll see a kind of, you know, line chart of Bitcoin starting in 2013, 2012, and all the way to 2022, had this explosive rise. So, so anyways, now this is, you know, just one cryptocurrency, right? But we want all cryptocurrencies, or at least for our purposes, the top 100. 
just to verify that indeed, you know, in pulling this uh, data on row 27, we only pulled one, um, you know, crypto, we, what we can do is we can quickly evaluate, you know, the name, for example. So if I just quickly run this, you'll see it just repeats Bitcoin, uh, you know, as, for as many rows as there are, you know, data. What you can do is just quickly uh, use the pipe operator and pass it through the unique function just like this. And you'll see there's only one uh, cryptocurrency name in this data set. So that's great. So that kind of accomplishes everything that we want. Uh, but now what we're going to do is we're going to try to pull in uh, the top 100 cryptos according to market cap. So I'm going to go back to this crypto underscore list function. And you, you can kind of right off the bat see that it has this funny ID column and the rank is not ordered according to the, the market cap. So we want to first order this column according to the rank and then just select the first 100 rows in the data set. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to arrange rank and then slice 1 to 100. From here, what you should end up seeing is now the rank column is in order and rather than several thousand rows, there are only 100 rows. So you can see over here, we have Bitcoin, Ethereum, Tether, BNB, and so forth down the list. Uh, the, these are kind of, you know, the, the crypto currencies ranked by their market cap. So, so this is kind of the list that we're going to run off of. So top 100 by market cap. I'm just going to assign this to this, uh, you know, object over here. I, I had mentioned previously that the uh, crypto history function is kind of quirky. The reason it's kind of quirky is if, if you want a particular list of uh, cryptocurrencies where it says coin list, you can't really put put in a vector of you know strings such as BTC and then ETH, and you know if, if you try running this, it's not going to work. Instead, what you have to do is pass through the entire list of coins based on you know this this data set's output. So what you would do is you would take your top 100 by market cap list over here and pass it into this crypto history function. I'll, I'll quickly run it, but I'm going to interrupt it. You can see I, I drop this into the crypto hi history and it works. I'm just gonna stop this process because it might take a while and we don't have all day to, to, to wait for this to, to pull in. So what I've done is I've saved a data set that's called crypto prices um, so that's what we're going to read in for, for this purpose. So we're going to do read underscore CSV crypto underscore prices dot CSV. And it looks like I'm having trouble interrupting this. So what I might have to do is just, there we go. I go to session very quickly and hit restart R. Just load my libraries in again. All right, so I'll just scroll all the way back down here. So, so we can see if I do read under, underscore CSV, this is kind of the data set that if you were to, to run and assign, you know, a, a crypto data set to uh, to this output, we, we can call it something to the effect of um, top 100 crypto prices. And what I'll do is I'll just call the same thing over here, top 100 crypto prices. You should get a very similar data set that has a timestamp, um, a um, you know, the slug and, you know, the same data that we saw for, for the Bitcoin data set. The one thing you're going to want to add to the end of this, if you're scraping it directly using this function, is going to be uh, the as date as character um, 
uh, function to, to kind of clean up that timestamp that we looked at earlier for Bitcoin. So, so this is kind of, you know, step one. So step one is let's pull in all of the crypto prices that we can. And so I'm going to go down to the next chunk here, which is let's just calculate the, the returns. So I'm going to refer back to this top 100 crypto prices data set. And first, what we're going to do is we're going to group by our um, symbol and we're, we're going to calculate the average, you know, the, the daily closing price change uh, for each symbol. So the way we do that is let's just make sure our timestamps are arranged. So if we arrange by symbol first, and then we arrange by timestamp, we can now see this is an alphabetical order, including numbers. So it starts with one inch and then, you know, all the way down eventually what we would expect to see with enough clicking is a, a different crypto slug. Uh, so the, the next symbol is AAVE. So, so you can see it's now kind of in order of symbol and timestamp. So what we want to do now is we want to add a new column that calculate, calculates the daily return. So let's just call this column daily underscore return equals the close, closing price, divided by a lag of the closing price. And we're just going to do minus one. And let's not forget to group by our symbol, just like that. So if we run this chunk of code over here, what we'll expect to see is a column that now says daily return. This is simply the percent change on the day relative to the day before, how much the cryptocurrency went up or down. So what we're going to do in our clustering algorithm, and let's just call this uh, crypto daily returns. And just to make this a lightweight data set, what I'm going to do is just select timestamp name. Let's keep the name in there. Let's keep the symbol. And let's just keep the daily return here because what we want to do is we want to cluster against the daily return to find uncorrelated assets relative to, um, you know, others. So in this case, we're looking at cryptocurrencies. So, so what we have to do from here is we put it through what's called a hierarchical clustering algorithm. So we, we have to do a few things to pre-process the data. So let's go into a new chunk. So we, we now are going to get this data ready for a hierarchical clustering algorithm. So what we're going to do is we're going to put it from a long format into a wide format. Uh, you'll, you'll see in a second what I mean by that. Effectively, what we want to do is pivot this long data set into a wider data set. And this pivot wider function has a, a variety of different, uh, you know, uh, parameters that you can put into it. But the, the second one here is ID calls. And you can see it says a set of column that uniquely identifies each observation. So in that case, this is the, the timestamp because every symbol has a unique timestamp associated with it. So that was ID underscore calls equals timestamp. And another parameter that the pivot wider function has is names from equals. In this case, we can type in name and then, so when, when we say names from, that's what's going to be turned into a column. And then we need to finish this up by saying values from equals daily underscore return. So if we give this a quick run, what we'll see is a, instead of long data set, I'm not sure how many rows this had. So this had 119,000 rows of data. You can see after pivoting this data set to a wider view, it now only has 300 uh, sorry, 3,000 rows and 101 columns. So if you recall our function up here to, to pull all the, the cryptocurrencies, crypto list arranged by rank and slice one to 100, 
This is 100 rows of data. We took this top 100 by market cap object and we passed it through, or you should have passed it through this crypto underscore history function, which is gonna scrape all the data. And, and we just uh, applied this very quick uh, function to clean up the timestamp. And so that's why we have a hundred, uh, you know, one columns, we have the timestamp plus these hundred cryptocurrencies. So, so here's how hierarchical clustering works. So it first we want to kind of calculate a correlation matrix between each of these cryptocurrencies against each other. So how correlated are the, the cryptocurrencies relative to each other? So, so what we can do very quickly here is just look at, you know, select our timestamp away because we want to exclude that from the correlation matrix. So now we just have a matrix of cryptocurrencies and you'll see if you just pass all of this through the core function, this is from the stats uh, package. What you'll get in return or what you should get in return are you know, a correlation matrix. So I'm gonna stop it right here because you can see there are a bunch of NAs that pop, popped up. So what we wanna do in our core function is use complete.obs. And, and so what we're saying here is only use complete observations, get rid of those NAs. And now you can see the correlation matrix that's printing out on the panel below, just a you know huge panel of correlations between each cryptocurrency relative to each other. So you can see the correlation in daily returns between one inch network and one inch network is exactly one because they're the same thing. So, so what, what we wanna do now is, if, if we think about clustering crypto returns, stock returns, bond returns, doesn't really matter what asset class, they, they can move either in a positive direction relative to each other, so when one goes up, the other goes up, uh, or they could be inversely correlated. And, and for this clustering logic, we don't really care about whether it's positively or negatively correlated simply because if the correlation is you know minus one that means it's perfectly correlated but when one moves up the other moves down by the same exact amount so so the the reason we are, are taking the absolute value is because we we're stripping out the directionality of the correlation coefficient and you can see if i just run the absolute value function right after the correlation matrix. Um, it, it just, you know, spits out the same thing, but there aren't any negative numbers. So, so from here, we want to calculate a, a distance matrix. So the hierarchical clustering algorithm uh, accepts a distance matrix. So basically what this distance uh, matrix says is like how closely related are, are these assets relative to each other. So, so yeah, that, that's you know the, the extent of the pre-processing that we have to take when um, you know preparing our data for a hierarchical clustering algorithm. Uh, so what we want to do now is wrap things up and put it into the H plus algorithm. So just gonna quickly do a question mark so you can see H plus comes from you know the stats package. So the description says hierarchical cluster analysis on a set of dissimilarities and methods for analyzing it. So if I quickly run this whole thing, you'll see there are a hundred objects. It just gives you this you know, very minimal set of information. What we're gonna do is we're gonna call, call this you know, HC right over here. And from here, what we're gonna do is we are going to take this HC object and let's quickly visualize this. So what, what we can do here is as dendrogram. And if I quickly run this, you'll see this is a dendrogram with two branches and 100 members total. Doesn't really mean much yet, but what we can do is quickly run plot and 
this might look a little more, uh, uh, you know, visually uh, digestible relative to just a bunch of uh, code. So I'm going to pop this open and you can see now what we have is a dendrogram. There's no formatting that's really been applied to this. Uh, so let's kind of spend some time uh, formatting this dendrogram uh, to, to quickly explain what it is we're looking at. So th this is, you know, kind of the output of a hierarchical clustering algorithm. It takes all of these different stock returns, bond returns, cryptocurrency returns, whatever you put into it. It could even be volatility, so you can cluster on volatility or whatever other metric that you care to look at. And, and it just kind of groups very similar things next to each other. And, and so it doesn't necessarily tell you, okay, there are exactly um, you know, for clusters, there are a few different approaches to saying, okay, from this information, how many clusters are there in this data set? We're, we're going to take a very simple approach, which is looking at this dendrogram, which is kind of a visual representation of the uh, hierarchical clustering algorithm. And you can see, you know, you have these branches. So it starts all the way at the top where, you know, 100% of all cryptos are represented. And, and then it kind of branches out. So this one big branch and then this other big branch. And then you can see this this branch over here is much you know narrower and you know this branch over here is much wider. And then you can see over here on the right, there's kind of this branch with, I, I'm just gonna guesstimate maybe 20% of all cryptocurrencies. And, and then there's this massive, you know, um, set of, um, cryptocurrencies which are kind of in in these two different clusters what people i guess like me like to do looking at you know these dendrograms is just kind of like splitting it somewhere down the middle there's you know both an art and science to this there are more mathematically rigorous approaches to splitting a set of clusters into each other but what what we'll do is we'll, we'll just kind of like eyeball it into you know maybe one two and three different clusters. So there, there's one over here, one over here, and one over here. So, so that was a, a very, you know, simple, um, you know, visual representation of our um, uh, uh, dendrogram. But what we can do is uh, use this package called um, the uh, dend extend and, and there's this really great function in here which takes this, you know, base R plot and converts it into a ggplot object. Uh, so what I'll do very quickly is I'll say, and first let's just kind of define the number of clusters that we want to look at. So let's say number clusters equals, I think we said three, so let's keep it at three. And, and in this uh, uh, package, there's a um, uh, function right here called color branches. So color branches, and then we're gonna say K equals number of clusters. And then there was also another function called color labels. So let's do this and just copy our code over as well, just like this. And, and you'll see if I just run it through this plot function once more, what it should do is color the clusters according to, um, you know, how, however many clusters it's able to identify, you know, the, the most uncorrelated clusters relative to each other. Uh, what, what I can do is I can, you know, ramp this up to something like 10 clusters. And what it should do is it should, you know, you know, as it does over here, now you have kind of like a bright orange, cluster over here, a darker one, a yellow one, a few shades of green all the way over here. Um, but let, let's just kind of take it back to three clusters for simplicity's sake. You, you can keep the kind of base R plot uh, just like this. There, there are some ways you can kind of beautify uh, this as it is. So I think what, if you want to look at it kind of inverted, you can do uh, this parameter, horas equals true. So a short form for horizontal, and, and it kind of flips the dendrogram across, you know, this uh, y-axis. Uh, you'll, you'll notice that the uh, text is barely legible. 
Um, there, there are some different utilities that you can do within the Dend uh, extend uh, package. There's a function called set, and you can look up the documentation for Dend extend later. One, one of the functions in here uh, are called labels underscore cex, and then so if you you know say two for example, it's going to double the size of the labels, which is not what we want to do. So. Now you can see we took it from something that's not legible, legible at all to something that's even less legible. I think you can also use uh, decimals to indicate that you want a fraction of the size of the label. So now you can see they're kind of uh, smaller in size. Uh, so I, I personally found the uh, horizontal to do more damage than, than it helped. So let's uh, look at this, um, you know, uh, the, the way that it, that it was before. So let, let's just think about the interpretation of these clusters that the machine's spitting out for us. Um, what's kind of interesting is you, you have this first cluster, uh, which is comprised almost entirely of stable coins. So you can see USD coin, you can see Tether is somewhere right over here. So, so the, these are stable coins, which, you know, basically don't move at all by design they, they were meant to be you know uh cryptos that track some underlying asset or you know some some underlying currency or commodities so these have been grouped with each other it looks like they're all us dollar stable coins which is quite interesting and and i i couldn't really tell you much uh about these other two groupings but one thing that i will say is the the size of this green grouping is much larger uh, than you know everything else? So it, it almost seems like there's more information in here than than we we want. So maybe you know in in some you know portfolio construction uh, uh, you know logic we would want to exclude stable coins and just apply this hierarchical clustering algorithm against you know, only the, the green cluster or some combination of the green and the blue um, with each other. So, so that's all kind of interesting. Uh, I, I did want to, so I'm gonna quickly comment this plot line out. I, I did want to show, you know, how, how you can take this and visualize it as a ggplot, um, you know, object. I, I personally write, like um, looking at, you know, plots and working with plots that, that are ggplot. Um, I think if you run this whole thing, it should technically work, uh, but there's no real other stuff in here. So what, what we can do is just pass this through a ggplot object, and you know maybe we can add a title to this. So title equals dendrogram of the top 100 crypto. Currencies by by market cap. Then we just give that a quick run. Um, let's see what it's didn't like something that I did. So if I just quickly give this a select run. Ah, so I think if I just pass this through, I incorrectly had a plus sign instead of a pipe operator. So so yeah, this is you know kind of the. Um, overall you know visual aspect of uh, working with hierarchical clustering looking at this chart in of itself is not really useful as much as uh, you know knowing what these individual clusters are right so in, in the next section here what we're going to do is we're, we're going to classify each of these cryptocurrencies into their corresponding cluster um, so what we're going to do very quickly is we're just going to grab this HC object. There, there's a really nice function called cut tree uh, in the dend extend package. And so you can see if I just take uh, this HC or hierarchical cluster um, uh, object, which we assigned in the previous trunk, I think we decided on using three clusters, I, I did call it something, so I think I called it number of clusters. So you can see now here it kind of spits out a, you know, 
one, two, or I, I think a three. I see a three right here. We, we wanna get this into something that's more usable, right? So what we're gonna do is just pass a pipe operator through over here and say as data frame. So let's take a look at this and see what it looks like. So, so we have kind of the row name corresponding with the cryptocurrency name and uh, this unnamed column. So let, let's first rename this, you know, first column to, um, let's just call it cluster equals one, right? So now it says cluster. And what we're gonna do is we want to bring these row names into a column and just say mutate uh, token name equals row names. And then we can just pass a dot and so now we have a data set with two columns that have the cluster name or the, the cluster value and the token name. So I, I'm, I'm noticing, uh, you know, cluster one and two are not the stable coins. So what we can do, let's say we just want to, you know, later on look at uh, only stable coins for whatever reason, what we can do is just filter cluster equals three and it should return a list of uh, these stable coins, which you can see we, we have all these USD coins, um, which, um, you know, th this is one, one of the uh, useful features of a hierarchical cluster. It allows you to have the machine break apart these different tokens into their own statistically similar groups. And, you know, stable coins are, are very statistically similar to each other, especially if they're tracking the, the same underlying, uh, you know, asset. So, so that kind of wraps things up for uh, section four. And I, I think that's uh, enough of cryptocurrencies for now. Um, what, what we want to do is basically do the same exact thing, but for stocks. Um, so if, if you don't have a, you know, Bloomberg terminal or, you know, a very, you know, expensive access to, you know, data sets that, you know, give you market data, um, there, there are some really nice, useful tools within the R ecosystem that allow you to, um, you know, pull in uh, price history. So for example, there's the TidyQuant uh, package, which uh, if, if you look at the TidyQuant documentation, they, they say, in, in the you know explanation of, of the actual package that they're kind of a wrapper for um, you know other packages so so they give you a convenient set of tools that just make coding much easier there there's one um, function in here that, that I quite like um, it it's it's kind of a wrapper to a quant mod uh, um, function, but we, we won't worry too much about that. What, what you can see is if, if I type in TQ underscore get, and let's just, for example, look at Apple stock, just running this one line of code will give you an entire history of stock prices. And it's, it's phenomenal. It goes directly to uh, the Yahoo Finance uh, API, I believe. Um, I, I think you can define, you know, some, some parameters uh, that allow you to uh, change uh, where you get the data from. I know in QuantMod you can define, you know, what APIs and things, but we're, we're just going to use TQGET from TidyQuant for its convenience. You can see very quickly, just like we did with, um, you know, the uh, Bitcoin price, we can just visualize Apple stock. Um, to, so let's look at uh, ggplot, geom, underscore line AES date comma close let's see what happens when we run this so they they also have an adjusted close price which I'm not sure if the close price column was adjusted or not uh, but let's just for you know to be safe use the adjusted close column so, so here's kind of the dilemma. I guess the dilemma is that we want a list of all S&P 500 companies, uh, but we don't have a list of S&P 500 companies yet. 
so what, what I'm going to very quickly do is uh, open up uh, Google Chrome over here. Uh, and let's just go to google.com. And so what we can do is just type in list of S&P 500 companies. And so I, I just want to find, you know, a table of S&P 500 companies that I can programmatically read in. Uh, let's just click on this first uh, link. And uh, sure enough, it looks like this uh, Wikipedia article has a mapping of the symbol. Uh, this goes into quite some detail with the, the name of the company, the GICs, you know, the, the Global Industry Classification Standard. So you can see whether you know, this stock ticker AES is a utility company and Aflac is a financial company. Even goes into more detail with the sub-industry. So this is a life and health insurance company. Man, it even gives you all these other uh, useful indicators. The headquarters location, when, when the stock was added, I guess, and when it was founded and such. So what we're gonna do, these details aside, is let's just quickly go uh, over here. So. This is, let's just call this our stock table URL. And let's just uh, paste this in here. So you can see if I run stock table URL, uh, it's just gonna give me, it's gonna, it's gonna give me this uh, link that, that I assigned to it. So make sure you go ahead and run that. Um, so, so now what we wanna do is we want to use the, uh, the Arvis. There, there's a great package, part of the tidyverse called Arvest. Um, it, it's extremely useful for scraping data from the web. I'd suggest learning this package in as much detail as you can because it's a it's a it's a great package to, to scrape data from the internet. There, there's a function in here called read HTML, or I guess this isn't the HTML2 package, but you can see when I run this, uh, it gives you a, a bunch of you know text and it, it basically what it does is if, if you right click on here and view the page source when when you view the page source of a website it you know websites are just code right so uh, when when you read in uh, programmatically using read html it just drops that into um you know your your R environment so, so there's a, a useful packet or a useful function that says HTML node or HTML nodes. Um, so node, as the name implies, is for singular and nodes is for a plural. So if, if you look at the uh, function description, it says more easily extract pieces out of HTML documents using XPath and CSS selectors. So let, let's do this, and what we're going to do is CSS equals table. So now I'm just going to quickly run this, and so it, it shows me that there are two tables in, in this uh, Wikipedia article, which is kind of funny. I only saw this one um, uh, table, but maybe there's another table somewhere down here. Yep, look at this. So this also has a... Uh, table. Okay, so this shows you the list of companies that have been delisted or, you know, changed in the S&P. So you have companies that enter and exit the S&P 500 all the time based on, you know, the criteria. Um, so, so what we want to do is let's first, um, you know, pull these tables out. Uh, what we can do is use extract and HTML html underscore table from Arvist. And I think if I just want to do fill equals true. So take a look at this. So running this, we have, you know, some, some console output, but there are two data frames that have been produced now. So you'll notice that the first data frame should correspond with the first column. And, you know, there are five or first table that we see in this Wikipedia article. Uh, the second data frame corresponds with the second one. Uh, so what I'm gonna very quickly do is just call this uh, all historic S&P tickers. Just gonna use SPX as a shorthand. 
So let's go ahead and give that a run. And, and so you can see if you just do SPS, all historical SPX ticker one, we can kind of uh, you know pull out this first data frame by referencing the first object in in this you know listed you know nested data frame. So more specifically, when when we run you know this entire chunk of code, um, it it says that this is a list of two objects, and and then it gives you a list of one data frame and a list of another data frame. So we just want to extract this first data frame. There are a couple ways to do it. Uh, I'm, I'm going to do the quickest uh, path of least resistance here and just reference object number one. And, and so you can see um, over here we have symbol security, basically everything that shows up in that Wikipedia article. Um, there, there's a package in uh, called janitor, janitor um, clean names. So um, what you what you'll see is um, the the column names kind of change. So it's kind of uppercase. There's spaces in between, which are kind of difficult to work with. Just passing it through clean names just makes it a lot easier to to reference uh, from a code perspective. And, and so that's kind of like really all that we want to do right now is just uh, clean clean this up a bit and let's just call this current SPX tickers. So cool, so now that we have, um, you know, a, a list of all the tickers in the S&P 500, let, let's think about how we're going to uh, apply this into uh, a function that lets us pull all of the price data at once. So, so what we can do is go back to that TQ underscore get. And basically what we want to do is we want to iterate through this symbol column against this TQ get function. So remember, if you just put in a symbol in TQ get, I, I'm just gonna copy MMM for 3M stock ticker and just you know run TQ get, you can see now it shows a symbol as MMM, and then you get all of this price data. So what, what we want to do here is we want to effectively take, let's create a function. So we're, we're going to do um, pull, pull all data. And you, you can you know use an anonymous function, so just using the dot let's add in a print and then what we can do is pass it to tq underscore get um, and, and then let's just uh, just you know wrap this up and call it a data frame as data frame so so now you can see if I do um, over here mmm mmm rather and then the type operator pull all data, what's gonna happen is it's gonna print MMM and then it's gonna return a data frame of uh, these different, uh, you know, uh, open, high, low, close type data. So what we can do, we, we can use a for loop, we can kind of use a, a map function. So I'll, I'll show, show you all how map works. So um, you can do, and you know, just so, there are 505 uh, tickers in the S&P 500 today. Uh, what, what I'm gonna do right now is slice one through four. So this is just gonna provide, you know, the first four tickers in, in this data set. So what I can do is say mutate data equals map symbol. So we're gonna map this column to this function. So you can see if I give this a run, it's now printing out each one of the tickers as it's going through them, and then it's producing a data set at the end. And, and you'll see there are a series of nested data frames in this data set. Let me just quickly call this uh, all SPX tickers, all SPX prices rather. Let's, let's call it something a little less uh, controversial here. So. 
So you can see now it's a data set with data in a column that's called data. You can pull all this data out by saying unnest underscore legacy. And you'll see rather than four rows after running this, there are 9,914 rows. So what we can very quickly do here, um, and you'll, you'll notice actually there's a symbol dot 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 one. I'm sure that's because there's another symbol data here. So what we're gonna do, let's just go ahead before unnesting this, let's select underscore, or sorry, minus symbol. So this is just gonna get rid of the symbol in, in the, the column over there because presumably there's a symbol somewhere in these eight columns over here. So if I quickly uh, rerun rows 135 to 137, you can see now uh, the symbol is over here. So let's quickly take a look at what this data uh, actually looks like. So ggplot, and, and we can use the pull trick. So pull symbol, and then unique. So now it's just gonna show how many unique symbols there are in this data set. We should already know this at this point. Um, so if, if we just uh, run a nest legacy again, we, we want to plot the date and let's just say the adjusted price, which I think there's a column right there. And, and let's so G um, line AES, whoops. Okay, so AES date comma adjusted. And what we'll do is we'll We'll add a facet, so I mean we can say color equals symbol over here. So I, I did do a other video uh, that goes more in depth on data visualization in R. If you haven't checked it out, I'm kind of blowing past a, a few important concepts, but uh, what we can do is facet wrap according to the symbol. And you can see now we have a panel of these uh, different stock prices uh, on individual charts. So that's all nice. So, so here's what we're gonna wanna do. We, we want to put this again through our hierarchical clustering algorithm. You'll, you'll remember in this very quick uh, um, you know, exercise of taking the ticker, mapping it through um, this function we created where it prints, it passes it through TQ get and, and uh, turns into a data frame. Not entirely sure how uh, necessary this is, but uh, I think just out of habit, I, I tend to do that. Um, what, what, what we can do now is uh, rather than slicing one through four, uh, we can just run all SPX prices through all of our current SPX tickers, which, you know, again, we have current underscore SPX tickers it's 505 objects and it's printing as it's pulling the data every single one. Um, so I'm not gonna wait for this whole thing to take place. And before you do run this, there's one one thing that I, I wanna show you. So there, there are some tickers which as you pull it in from this Wikipedia article, um, such as Berkshire Hathaway. Um, so there's Berkshire Hathaway dot B and then they have, I think, somewhere like .a or something. Uh, so if you just do brk.b in the tqget function, it's not gonna like that. It's gonna return a na, and it's uh, just gonna give you this error message that says we're unable to import this, this uh, ticker. Reason for that is because uh, the specific format in which you need to pull the data in uh, has to, you know, after a, you know some trial and error, what I discovered was it has to be a dash, not a dot. So, so before we run all underscore SPX stickers, uh, what we're gonna wanna do is we're going to take our current SPX stickers, which is a list of all tickers in the S&P, and then we're gonna do mutate symbol equals from the stringer package there, there's a function called string replace all. Uh, so our string in this case 
is symbol. The pattern, in this case, is a dot. We'll soon see that this dot doesn't actually work, and we'll take a look at how to how to fix that. And then the replacement is a dash because we we need to get into a dash. But you'll see if we just run this, all the stock tickers are, are just three dashes, sometimes four dashes. That that doesn't help, does it? So so the reason that's happening is because a dot is a special character. So what we want to do very quickly is just put this in square brackets and you'll see that what R in the stringer package does is it treats that as a special character. So let, let's just uh, try, try to see what happens if we filter symbol equals brk dash, or uh, I think it was dot from Wikipedia, dot b. So you can see we, we do have brkb, and, and after we run this mutate function to replace dots with hyphens, we can just verify that it worked by looking at brk-b and see if anything shows up. And indeed it shows up, and we know after having tried running the tqget with brk-b it works. So, so now we can safely run this entire uh, you know, chunk of code and, and know that in, you know, all of these cases, it's going to work. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to, you know, run through this whole thing. I, I did also save, uh, you know, over here, a SPX historical prices object or a CSV file. Uh, so where in your case, you're going to want to let this all run. Um, and let's, let's also just add in select, select minus symbol, and then a nest legacy. So rather than a nested data frame, we're just gonna, you know, output the, the entire data frame. So my CSV file is the equivalent to this, where you have all SPX prices you take your current SPX tickers, which is the ticker list that we scraped from Wikipedia. You do some processing of, of the uh, symbol just to get it in a TQ get friendly function or fashion. Um, then we just map the symbol column to our functional sequence called pull underscore underscore uh, all underscore data. And you know, just kind of do some more cleaning, select the symbol, and unnest everything. So what it should look like in the end is what I have saved down in the read underscore CSV. So the SPX historical prices. So let's just quick, quickly take a look at what this should look like at, at the end of uh, the exercise. So. One, one thing you'll notice is uh, there, there's a lot more data. So we're pulling daily data for all S&P 500. So there, there's about a million rows of data. So when, when you uh, go through this, you know, all underscore SPX prices, uh, uh, you, know, you know, sequence, you, you shouldn't end up having a similar amount of rows. So it, it's a good chunk of data. So that kind of concludes the first section, Let, let's also kind of uh, just recap what we did here. So so we, we scraped data from Wikipedia. We used Wikipedia to pull in all S&P 500 companies. If you want to do some you know historical analysis, there might be some usefulness in looking at the delisted companies as well. So instead of all historical SPX tickers, you can look at number two just like this, and and so this should be a you know list of companies that you know maybe for you know merger and acquisition reasons or for whatever you know other uh, reasons you know you, you had these different events. Maybe this is a, a data set where you have changes to the S and P, so it could be new additions or removals. So just keep this in mind uh, as as you uh, look look at this data. For, for our purpose, what we're just gonna do is uh, look at our clustering algorithm against uh, these S&P 500 uh, companies that are currently listed. 
And, and so yeah, so now what we wanna do is we wanna do the same exact thing. So let's take this price data and pass it through the H cluster algorithm. So uh, let's uh, clean this data set up uh, just to make the number of columns a little more uh, you know, manageable and, and useful here. So we, we have 17 columns. We don't necessarily need all of them. Uh, I'm, I'm primarily doing this for, um, you know, uh, just keeping things organized, but also uh, so, so you can see all the columns here. So what we'll do is select security. Uh, I think there is a column somewhere here corresponding with the name and we can just quickly glimpse at this data set. And so, okay, so we have security, uh, we have the symbol. So let's bring in the symbol. Uh, we also want the adjusted close column, so let's just bring in adjusted. And I think that should be just about everything we need. Um, we don't. Oh, we also need the date, so let's not forget the um, the uh, date for you know these this price data. So we can do select date, comma security, comma symbol, and so let's just remove this glimpse over here. So now you can see we have a date security symbol adjusted. Uh, if you want to verify that we have every single one of the tickers in here, we can just quickly pull security, then unique. And so this should pull a list of all the unique companies. So you'd see everything from Accenture to Activision Blizzard to, you know, all of these S&P 500 companies, right? So, so that's exactly what we want to do. We want to take these companies, calculate their daily price change in the stock market, and and then you know pass this through this clustering algorithm that's going to find you know highly correlated stocks, put them into a cluster, you know their own individual cluster, and then the extra thing we're going to do in this case is we're going to create a portfolio of stocks, uh, you know that 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 we can compare against uh, a, I, I guess we could say a unoptimized portfolio. So maybe what we'll do is we'll just select one cluster by itself and see, you know, the performance of, you know, selecting individual stocks in a cluster, um, in each individual cluster, or, you know, the performance of an entire cluster uh, comparatively. So enough talking, we still have some work to do. So what we'll do is pivot this uh, data set to wider. So if you if you remember, ID calls is our date. Our security is so names underscore from equals security and values from of course values. Oh, we also need to calculate the daily close. So let's not forget that. So we want to group by and just to make sure our data is organized in the right way. We're gonna arrange first by the security name or the symbol, let's do symbol, doesn't really make a difference. Symbol and then date. So you can see after arranging, and it might take a little while just to show what this looks like because there's a million rows that need to be sorted. Uh, it sorts the symbol first, so A is the very first ticker and then it organizes by date. So so now what we can do is group by our symbol. And then what we'll do is mutate our daily return equals adjusted divided by lag of adjusted minus one. So this is gonna give us the, the daily return. Whoops. And so what we'll do over here now is pivot wider ID calls. And so now we just need to add values underscore from equals daily underscore return. So I think if I did everything right here, it should work. And now what we should end up with is a pretty, pretty big uh, wide panel of uh, stock returns. Um, according to the date on the first column and then every other column is going to correspond with the, the the company name so you see we have you know Apple 
we have Adobe and Autodesk and basically the stock returns for each one of these individual tickers. So same deal applies, uh, you know, where we take this through, you know, correlation function, uh, use complete dot dot OBS. And before we do this, let's just get this uh, data set into it. Uh, let's just call it wide uh, stock returns. So instead of a long format, it's a wide format. So we don't have to keep running this uh, computationally uh, intense uh, calculation all the time. So if we just do wide underscore stock returns, and I think if we run this through the correlation function, let's not forget we uh, need to remove the date because we don't want the date to be included in the correlation logic here. So one, one extra thing here, it says no complete observations. So what I might do is uh, na.omit and just run this. So we're just gonna let this load for a bit. And now, so after getting rid of some NAs very naively, uh, it looks like it works. So same, same thing applies where we want to take the correlation matrix, pass it through a distance matrix, and then again, pass it through our H clust algorithm. And so again, if you just give this whole thing a run, uh, I'm gonna call this HC once more. And so now in this case, we can just you know refer back to the code that we used for the cryptocurrency example. So where we do HC as dendrogram. Um, I'll, I'll show you all something uh, different this time to keep it somewhat exciting. So, so, so actually, let, let's take a look at this dendrogram first uh, without any colors. Um, GG extend. So instead of uh, calling this dendrogram of the top 100 cryptocurrencies, let's call it the top or dendrogram of the S&P 500 constituents by market cap. Or we don't really need this. Let's give this a run and see what happens. So you can see there's a lot more data in here. Uh, so uh, extrapolating any real um, meaning from this uh, dendrogram uh, and trying to visually inspect the 500 stocks down here is gonna be a fool's errand. So let's just use this dendrogram to identify the optimal number of clusters that we want to select. Uh, so I, I see there's kind of, you know, these branches, you know, and then the sub branches and sub branches uh, for, you know, the sake of simplicity, let, let's just, you know, uh, select six just for some naive uh, stock selection. You can see it kind of organizes these individual clusters into uh, these six groupings. So the, these tend to be, you know, the, the closely related clusters if we were to pick six clusters. Uh, so, so yeah, I'm, you know, and, and there, there are a lot of interesting things that you can do with this. I mean, so maybe there's some common factors that influence this cluster, but not this cluster or more you know, likely this cluster, but not the one on the very right. And, and so you can start to do some you know, interesting research to analyze why one cluster is correlated with each other, but not another cluster. And what, what are the underlying factors that make you know, these stock returns behave in, in this fashion? So, so, so yeah, there, there's uh, some interesting stuff you can do there. Uh, for our purpose, what we're gonna do uh, is move on to section seven, which is kind of uh, an exciting section. So, so what we want to do here is we want to randomly select one stock um, from each one of these six clusters, and then we're going to construct a portfolio 
um, of these six stocks, and then we'll compare it to a portfolio of just one, one of these clusters individually. Uh, we, we can evaluate how the portfolio performed over time, you know, based on, uh, you know, a sharp ratio, analyze, you know, annualized returns or whatever have you. And, and so what, what we'll see is, you know, to, you know, whether this, uh, diversified cluster based approach was, you know, a better investment decision relative to just selecting one cluster individually. Uh, so again, what we want to do is just pull out these clusters. So there is the function that we had used previously um, in, in the uh, cryptocurrency example called cut tree. So same thing applies over here, cut tree uh, HC. And then in this case, let's just pick six clusters. So you'll see, I'm going to stop the printing. Apple is in cluster three. American Airlines Group is in cluster two. Uh, Advanced Auto Parts is in cluster two. Interestingly, they're part of the uh, same uh, same industry. You can see Alaska Airlines is also in cluster two. So there there is some you know method to, to the madness. Uh, so you, you you can see Allstate, an insurance company, is in uh, you know cluster two. So you know maybe because they do. Uh, insurance for you know travel and you know car insurance and we also have advanced auto parts which is in cluster two uh, they, they could have some similar factors that help you know explain why the daily returns move in a way they do that are different than you know perhaps cluster three such as Apple um, really useful tool guys and, and, and gals so I, I, I would suggest uh, using this in, in your analysis where where you can uh, so let, let's do as data frame over here, same same process where we want to you know say cluster so rename our cluster equals one and then uh, comp mutate mutate company underscore name equals row names. So cool. So now we have a a uh, selection of clusters. So let's just say um, uh, stock plus clusters. So so now what we want to do is we want to randomly select because we have six clusters. Let's randomly select one from each. So the way we can do this is group by cluster. Cluster, and then we'll sample n size equals one. So what's going to end up happening here is now we have a cluster, a company from every single cluster. So you can see cluster one is re represented two, three, four, five, and six. We only picked six clusters. If you were to pick ten clusters, for example, and and see how this looks. Uh, now we have, you know, even more clusters. So there's, you know, the, the clusters are different this time. Um, but every time you run this sample n, um, you know, function, the companies are going to be different every single time, right? So I'm just running it and running it and running it. So you can see it randomly samples. Uh, there's our advanced auto parts again, cluster two. So what we're going to do over here is we're just going to say randomly selected And, and so the, the point of this part of the tutorial is we want to create a portfolio of this and compare it to a portfolio of any one of these clusters. Uh, let's keep looking at cluster two. Uh, we'll, we'll so like a target underscore cluster right now is two. And so what we can do over here is just call this individual underscore cluster. So instead of uh, sampling uh, all these clusters, we want to do filter cluster equals target cluster. And let's keep the sample size to six because we have six 
companies that are randomly selected and randomly selected stocks. Make sure we give this a run. So our randomly selected stocks has you know this selection of co companies, and we're going to take start stock clusters down here, filter our cluster to target cluster, so number two, and then sample the size to n equals six. So now we have a list of companies in you know one cluster, and then we have a list of companies from each cluster. So now the the point of this exercise is to see you know, did our diversified portfolio of uncorrelated stocks perform better or worse compared to this, uh, you know, portfolio of highly correlated stocks? And, and so what we'll do now is I think we have a uh, object over here. If we scroll all the way up, we called it all SPX prices. So let's take all SPX prices. Now what we want to do is we want to filter the, um, let's see here, security in randomly selected stocks company name. So what we're doing is we are filtering the security column to only equal instances in which we see these company names. So if I just run all underscore SPX prices very quickly, you can see it's 1 million rows of data. And if I run this after filtering, you can see it's only 14,000. So, and it also should theoretically include um, our randomly selected stocks up here. We can quickly verify that just by running these two things simultaneously. And you can see in the first uh, section we have um, over here, Etsy, Marathon Oil, Align, Excel Energy, NRG Energy, and Perkin Elmer. And over here I see Align. So, I mean, for something more scientific, we could do the, uh, the pull test. So pull security unique. And it should be the same exact thing as your randomly selected stocks, and it sure enough is. So, so that's great. So now what we want to do is construct a portfolio and see how if you were to hold these stocks uh, over time, how how your portfolio would perform. So, so what we're going to do, uh, we're we're going to use the portfolio analytics uh, package to to you know do a lot of the heavy portfolio lifting for us. Um, but first, let's just uh, do the same deal where we uh, look at, you know, the, the daily closing price uh, where, so, so let's do a range symbol date. So now it should be organized by the symbol and then our date right over here. So you can see it starts in 2012. It's important you do this because if, if you if you run this, you you'll see. Uh, well, I guess in this case it doesn't really fall out of order, but there there could be cases where the data set that you're working with is not in order. So it's always useful just to make sure that you you know compute your daily returns after verifying that you have you know the a date organized because you're taking this adjusted closing price divided by this adjusting closing price. So so just make sure data set is in, in the right order. So now we can group by symbol and it helps to spell correctly and mutate our closing price equals adjusted divided by lag adjusted one and then minus one So if we run all of that, and we can now see we have a um, you know panel of our um, daily closing price for our randomly selected stocks. What we can do is again pivot this wider according to the date. ID calls equals date, 
mains from equal symbol and uh, values underscore from equals closing underscore price. All right. So, so this is kind of what, what our portfolio now looks like. So you can see there, there are instances in which we don't, you know, have data for certain companies. So Etsy, I, I guess, may have uh, been added later on. So sure enough, when I go to the end of the data set, uh, we, we can see that Etsy uh, only started trading or there's data in this data, data set in 2015. Uh, that's okay though, because what we're gonna do is, I mean, this is a very na naive approach, but we're, we're just gonna call this portfolio underscore one. And let's do the same thing over here for portfolio number two. Uh, so I'm just gonna copy all of this data over. The only difference is we wanna filter the security in our individual cluster stock so individual cluster company name so portfolio two should be exactly the same thing as portfolio one but the only difference is the six companies that we've selected are different this time so so now we can see individual clusters we have hp gap wind resorts the travelers companies and such um, so what, what we'll do is just run this. And, and now, so we, we want to kind of simulate what it would have been like to own, you know, these stocks in a, in a individual portfolio. We're not going to do any fancy buying or selling of the stocks. Um, we're, we're just going to see what would happen if you bought and held over, you know, the, the time of this data set. So in order to do that, so there, there's the portfolio analytics package, which I'm, I'm a huge fan of. And uh, you, you can see there are all sorts of different functions in here. Um, more, more than I know uh, off the top of my head, but there, there are quite a lot in here. Um, there, there's one that, that I, I like using, which is return.portfolio. Uh, as you can see in, in the uh, description of the function, it says, using a time series, this function calculates the returns of a portfolio with the same periodicity of the returns data. Um, and let's quickly take a look at this function by adding a question mark uh, to the left of it and running this. You'll see it show up in your help. Uh, there, there are a few examples here, but one thing to keep in mind is the first series that it's expecting is a data set in a particular fashion. So an XTS, a vector matrix, a data frame, and so forth. Um, I, I tend to use XTS objects for this type of stuff. Uh, so I'll, I'll show you what, what that all kind of looks like. So XTS is the object type. And, and you can see there's some parameters we want to fill in here. So X is our series, so portfolio underscore one. And, and so X is effectively portfolio one, everything except the first column. So we can just add a minus one. And then we want to order by the date. So portfolio, portfolio one and then date should be good. Frequency in this case is gonna be 252. Um, there's kind of some arbitrariness to it, but you'll, you'll see, you know, looking at the uh, documentation from portfolio analytics uh, they they tend they you know out of the box recommend you use 252 for a daily series I'm gonna quickly run this and you'll see um, you know we, we have the the timestamp the returns and you know it's in just a slightly different uh, format so I'm gonna call this portfolio portfolio one XTS and then what you can see after dropping this XTS object into our return our portfolio return is you know it, it's it's just producing a data set of the the portfolio returns 
what, what you'll notice is in the very beginning it says NA is detected filling NA's with zero so if you remember we didn't have any any uh, stock return data for for one of those companies because it, it hadn't been li listed yet um, but yeah that, that's kind of you know the idea of what we want to do here uh, we can call this uh, portfolio one returns and then let's just uh, repeat the same exercise for portfolio two. So I'm just gonna very quickly, um, you know, uh, replace portfolio one with portfolio two over here. And you go ahead and do the same thing. So you can see now we have portfolio two returns in its own object. So what we're gonna to wanna to do now is we're just going to compare the returns between these two things. Uh, there, there are some cool functions uh, that we can quickly do to look at you know, the sharp ratio and the annual returns. Um, so I think in, in the uh, portfolio analytics um, uh, library, there's a function called sharp ratio dot annualize. So, for a given vector of daily returns, it's gonna tell you what the, um, or it should at least tell you what the um, uh, sharp ratio is. So what, what we wanna do is uh, set the frequency, I think. So let's just, ah, so this also probably needs to be in an XTS object, so. Uh, let's see if we can do XTS objects. X, maybe we just do XTS portfolio returns and then frequency is date. Okay, so there we go. So I think that did the trick here. And so we can look at portfolio one and portfolio two. So let's make sure our objects are defined. And so great, so you can see we have a sharp ratio that's been produced for portfolio one and portfolio two. Um, just to remind you what the sharp ratio is, it's a kind of measure of a risk adjusted return. So it penalizes you if you have a, you know, very risky portfolio. Um, so, so just kind of right off the bat, I'm noticing that portfolio one, which is our kind of, uh, you know, optimized portfolio based on these different individual clusters has a you know much better sharp ratio, a very good one relative to um, you know portfolio two. That that all kind of makes sense because um, portfolio two, if you recall, is just a portfolio of individual stocks in the same cluster. So there could be you know some event that they uh, were influenced by. It could be you know some policy change. It could be some macroeconomic drivers. It could be a pandemic. It could be a lot of things, um, but. The, the point is portfolio two is, you know, not diversified uh, because all the stocks in this portfolio are uh, correlated to each other. Uh, so it, it makes sense that you have a better risk adjusted return uh, in portfolio one, because by definition, what we're doing is we're pulling out the stocks that, that are uncorrelated and then putting them into a basket um, of, of a portfolio uh, compared to each other. So some other things we can do. So let's let's just kind of compare the cumulative returns um, of portfolio one compared to uh, portfolio two. I'll, I'll show you some other things getting outside the uh, portfolio analytics world. Um, as, as you saw me stumble through the uh, sharp ratio uh, calculations, uh, the data does need to be in a kind of a particular format for it to, to work. So I, I tend to, to, to do all my calculations by hand just because I know exactly what's going in, exactly what's going out. Um, so I'll show you a simple example of what that might look like 
um, just com computing the cumulative returns of these two portfolios. So mutate. Um, so you, you can see the date over here is uh, in the row name. So let's just bring that in. So date equals uh, row names dot just like that. And it, it's a character uh, data object. So we, we just want to convert that into a date. So we can just do date equals ymd date. Now it's a date object. And, and so what we're going to do is we're going to join portfolio one and portfolio two on, on the day. So we'll just do inner join, just copy this entire chunk over. And instead of portfolio one returns, portfolio two returns. So after joining all of this, uh, let's see here. Portfolio one returns, and then portfolio two returns. So what we also wanna do is because, so if you notice when it was joining, um, it joined by this column portfolio return. So that, that's not exactly correct. So let's rename or um, let's call it diversified portfolio equals one. So now if I just run this, you'll see column one says diversified portfolio and we can call this uh, instead of undiversified, let's call it a single cluster portfolio. So now what it should do is after putting in this pipe operator over here, now we have a column that says diversified portfolio and this is our daily portfolio returns. And then we have another one for the single cluster portfolio. So now let's just compute a cumulative return. So so I mean, if, if you really wanna quickly take a look at what this uh, looks like, you, you can just do geomline AES date diversified diversified whoops diversified portfolio oops and it would definitely help to spell things right so let's just copy and paste that in so we have it exactly exactly right so you can see this is just daily returns it looks like a bunch of white noise uh, you can see some, you know, periods of time where, you know, the portfolio goes up and down and up and down. Um, we can do the same thing very quickly looking at the single cluster portfolio. Um, you know, again, there, there are periods where it goes up and down and up and down. It seems like there's a, you know, big, you know, series of up and down and up and down, but um, it's kind of hard to really extract any meaning from this right now. So what we want to do is uh, compute the cumulative returns for each of these portfolios. So let's just, again, arrange date. You can't arrange your dates enough. Um, the starting point should always be the same if you're comparing portfolios to each other. Just make sure that's the case for you. It should be in, in this tutorial, but if you're doing this out in the wild, uh, definitely make sure your comparisons are, are you know, apples to apples and that, that applies to the starting date. Um, in, in this case. So what we'll do is we'll mutate diversified portfolio cumulative equals, then we'll use the cum prod one plus diversified portfolio minus one. So this is simply the equation to calculate cumulative returns. You take the cumulative product of the returns. It's not the cumulative sum of the products because uh, stocks and interest are compounding. Uh, so you have to make sure you do that. Otherwise, you're not going to get the right results. So so now what we can do is just you know very quickly see what this looks like. So now we have you know two extra columns. So we have a single cluster portfolio and a diversified. Uh, portfolio cumulative returns. 
So let's let's uh, keep this, you know, chunk of code that we have over here. Uh, call it a single cluster portfolio cumulative. And let's just make this uh, color equals. I don't know. Let's make this a blue. And let's just add in our diversified portfolio cumulative column. Whoops. Diversified portfolio underscore cumulative. And let's make this orange. And let's give this a run, see, see what this looks like. And again, make sure you spell right and do not make the same mistakes I make. So let's pretty this up very quickly. So labs title equals comparison of portfolio returns. And then we can say in our subtitle, maybe subtitle equals uh, orange. Uh, let's make this a little nicer. So portfolio using hierarchical clustering orange versus single cluster and then blue and then I, I notice the y-axis and you know some some of these labels need to kind of be cleaned up so let's say um, at, uh, y equals cumulative return and this is in percent so so let's also scale our y-axis y continuous labels equals so what we want to do here is just uh, reformat the y-axis so it's a percent uh, we can even add you know to, to make this look even nicer um, you know let's add a, a vertical line or a horizontal line so geom h line aes y intercept equals zero and let's make this a black line. So, so here, here you can see it's pretty interesting, right? So you can see in our, our diversified portfolio, the the stock returns, you know, following, you know, after 2017, seem to begin to outperform, you know, the blue line. And if if you had bought the diversified portfolio at the beginning of 2012 you would have you know currently been around 600 percent returns uh, but holding the undiversified portfolio from 2012 over the same exact time period um, your your returns are you know less than 200 percent so this is you know a a portfolio over you know 10 years uh, of holding so it, it really goes to show how you know having diversification is, is uh, an important tool in, in a portfolio, so you're kind of less exposed to to, to big risks um, that a, that a single you know undiversified portfolio might be exposed to. And one of the ways we can do that is using this dendrogram approach, using hierarchical clustering uh, to you know identify which is correlated versus uncorrelated for portfolio construction purposes. There, there's a lot of other interesting stuff that we can do with all of this. Um, I'll, I'll just kind of wrap things up by, I, I think I had said we could take a look at the annualized returns. Um, I, I know the portfolio an analytics return, you know, they, they have this function called return annualized. Uh, we can quickly take a look at this. So if you were to high, uh, you know, hold uh, portfolio one, that would you know make you 21% per year uh, versus portfolio two, which would be 10% per year. Now note, if you followed along in the code, it's going to be slightly different because uh, I kind of arbitrarily you know selected target cluster two. Uh, we let's take a quick look at you know how this compares, and you know if you were to rerun 
our random sample of companies, or rather, if, if I were to just run this entire chunk of code, um, you know, the, the returns are all gonna be different. So the companies that are in this portfolio are slightly different. Um, you can see now the sharp ratio is 0.92. Um, and you know, the sharp ratio is 0.67. Annual returns look quite similar. Uh, I think before it was 10%, now it's 16% for portfolio two. And you know, I selected the second cluster so we can also select you know, the fourth cluster. Maybe there is a cluster which is you know, uh, a better cluster compared to um, you know, cluster, you know, the, the diversified portfolio. So it seems like the sharp ratio for uh, whatever cluster I just ended up selecting, cluster four, is, is you know, much better than cluster two. Uh, but you can still see that the diversified portfolio so far and you know, all of the uh, different runs that I have done uh, have, have outperformed uh, the undiversified portfolio by, by a long shot. And, and so, so th this is really you know, the, the usefulness of uh, hierarchical clustering within the context of investing. You can apply this to cryptocurrencies, you can apply this to stocks and bonds and even real estate. Um, you know, so, so th this is kind of you know, the, the conclusion of episode three. Um, you know, if, if you found any of this useful or interesting, let me know in the comments. I'd, I'd love to hear about it. Um, if you have any questions, let me know and happy to talk more about it. Um, I'm going to put all the code up in GitHub. And if you have, you know, follow up questions from there, just give me a shout if you get stuck or anything. I'd appreciate if you could follow me here on YouTube. Um, and yeah, just stay tuned for, for more videos here in the future. Uh, thanks so much for your time and uh, happy coding.